Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you. January 16th. Can you believe it's January 16th already? Eight o'clock in the evening, and we've gathered tonight to kind of have week two of our class on Please Don't Ask as we talk about questions that sometimes people ask that we kind of wish they wouldn't ask. All right. And so as people are still coming into the room tonight, let me encourage you. You can always use the chat box if you'd like to feel free to do that. Um, and you can email me questions if you would like, will at greatbridgebaptist.org. Uh, feel free to do that. You could do it either tonight or you could do it, you know, through the week. If you think about it, I uh, would love to have you do that. Also, let me encourage you, if you would, to like this channel, if you would like or subscribe to it, subscribe to the channel here on YouTube, it will notify you every time a new uh, class is posted. Okay. So you'll be able to get those updates and watch them if you'd like. Uh, love to have you watch them. You might even want to like the video or share it. Feel free to do that as well. But I'm just so glad that you could join me this evening, January 16th. Wow. 2024. Can you believe it? Man. Well, folks are still coming in here. I'm seeing numbers. Um, but let me... Um, I, I do have coffee again this week. Thank you for responding so well to the coffee portion of the video last week. If you remember last week, I did peppermint mocha, or as I like to call it, Christmas in a cup, which was wonderful. I enjoyed that. Tonight, I'm doing something different. Not quite as, uh, I don't know, as uh, more tame, I guess. Uh, tonight, I'm doing just a caramel, a caramel coffee, or as some of you might say, caramel. I would be intrigued to know who says caramel, who says caramel, who says pecan, who says pecan. Uh, that would be kind of interesting. So if you want to send me an email or put that in the chat box, that'd be great. Just love to hear. I mean, just kind of a fun stat. Maybe I could, maybe I could do a survey and uh, who knows, maybe write an article someday about uh, the scientific survey I've taken about if it's caramel or caramel. But anyway, thanks for joining me tonight and get your sip of coffee because we're about ready to jump in and discuss our question for this week. And the question for this week is, how can you be sure that God exists? Now, this is a great question. You see, the existence of a personal moral God is absolutely fundamental to all that Christians believe. If if there is no moral God, then there's no moral being against whom you and I have sinned. And if there is no moral being against whom you and I have sinned, then guess what? There's no need for salvation at that point. Also, if there's no God, then guess what? There's no acts of God, no miracles, you know, all those great stories we've read about Jesus and all the incredible things that we saw God do in the Old Testament, all those things. No, it's just myth, fiction. That's how it would be understood. So the answer to this question is important because a lot of people in their pre-evangelism stages are thinking like this, all right? People who are, they're not ready to get to the point of saying, are you willing to follow Christ or not follow Christ? They're still trying to answer questions in their mind. And one of the questions they're trying to ask is, does God exist? And so that's really one of the, first questions that I think you and I have to be ready to answer. Does God exist? Now, a second question that's very similar to the first is if God does exist, then what is he like? All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend time this week and next week talking about those two questions. All right. Is it possible to know if God really exists, or is this just something that you and I get to decide on our own? All right. So when it comes to us asking if God really exists, some of our contemporary philosophers out there today are going to, are going to say, no, there's no way you can know that God really exists for sure. They're going to say, no one can really know that because his existence isn't provable. That really what we've got is we've just got a bunch of stories, we've got a bunch of legends, we've got about a, a, a bunch of tales. There's a lot of delusional thinking, but they're going to say there has been no proof yet offered. What they mean by that is the right proof that they're willing to accept. 
There is no proof that they're willing to accept that's been offered yet that would make me believe. But here's the thing. There is a truth and there is a reality about the existence of God, even if people choose to disregard it. And that's part of the problem here. Mortimer Adler, the philosopher, said this, there is a reality that is independent of the human mind to which the mind can either conform or fail to conform. In other words, what we think does not create or in any way affect what we are thinking about. It is what it is. Whether we think about it or not, and regardless what we think about it, it is what it is. So the question is, is, is Christianity something that is provable? Friends, I believe it is. Now, if there is anything that I agree with skeptics about, it's this point that you and I should not believe in God simply because we've been taught to do so. But God wants more than that from us. All right. So, so all these people say, well, that's just all I've always been taught. Do you realize God wants more from you than that? It's not about what you've always been taught. God calls us to a deeper understanding of him than simply just having blind faith because someone else told us to. And, and while we're talking about it, nor should we accept teaching as truthful Christian doctrine without really getting in and exploring it and researching it to make sure that it's biblically sound. No, friends, God invites us into a relationship with him. He, devi- he desires that we learn as much about him as we possibly can, that we learn to trust him as much as we can, and that we love him as much as we can. He desires for us to grow in that relationship. He's not looking for blind faith. He wants us to grow, and he wants to reveal even more about himself. Friends, I hope that you'll understand that, that Christianity is built on fact. And not just faith. I know what the world wants to say. People can spin it however they want to spin it. But people who have an agenda don't get a chance to tell us what we believe is based on fiction. No, Christianity is based on fact and not just faith. Despite what our critics say, Christianity through the years has proven to be grounded in a strong evidence. It has a high degree, did you hear that? A high degree of probability for its claims of truth. We see God's handiwork everywhere. We see evidence of God's existence. And so many of the amazing, intricate details of this world. DNA. DNA itself shouts of a deliberate designer who not only created the world, but guess what? He keeps that world going. I wrote a quote this week by Marilyn Adamson. She wrote this, how is it that we can identify laws of nature that never change? Why is the universe so orderly and so reliable? The greatest scientists have been struck by how strange this is, There's no logical necessity for a universe that obeys rules, let alone one that abides by the rules of mathematics. This astonishment springs from the recognition that the universe doesn't have to behave this way. It is easy to imagine a universe in which conditions change unpredictably from instant to instant, or even a universe in which things pop in and out of existence. Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winner for quantum Electrodynamics said this, why nature is mathematical is a mystery. The fact that there are rules at all is kind of a miracle. (laughs) Friends, I love how we can see in God's word and all around us, God wanting to reveal himself and tell us about his nature and even tell us about his plan for creation and mankind. So let's talk about some evidence that's out there for the existence of God. Let's deal, first of all, under the heading of creation, all right? Creation really does stand as a profound testimony to the existence of God. It it showcases his divine craftsmanship. It showcases his creative power. 
I mean, if we just look at Psalm 19, 1, it, it kind of tells us something that we should already know. And that is the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. This verse here really does encapsulate the idea that the beauty, the intricacy, and the order observed in this natural world, that this isn't random, but pers- purposeful. And it reflects a masterful creator is what it does. Listen, when you and I gaze on the vast expanse of the heavens, we witness a, a majestic canvas painted with all kinds of celestial wonders. The complexity of galaxies and, and stars and planets, all following precise laws of physics, points to the fact that there was a design and an intelligent designer. The sheer magnitude and orderliness of, of the cosmos, as it was highlighted there in Psalm 19.1, invite us to contemplate on the existence of God, the designer of such an awe-inspiring spectacle, you know? But beyond the cosmic expanse, beyond the intricacies of earthly creation, further testify to a purposeful creator as well. From the delicate design of a flower, you know, to the ecosystems that are extremely intricate. I know we use that word a lot, but they are intricate and they sustain life. Every detail speaks of a, of a thoughtful and intentional architect. The natural world operates in a, in a delicate balance. It, it showcases harmony and interdependence. The cycles of seasons, uh, the symbi- symbiotic relationships among species, the finely tuned environmental conditions that we experience for life reflect a design, a creator, orchestrating a, a beautiful symphony. You know, I think that verses like Psalm 19.1 and others invite believers to to contemplate the testimony of creation as a a gateway to recognizing and acknowledging God's existence. As you and I immerse ourselves in the wonders of this natural world, we find a compelling argument for the reality of a creator. (laughs) And a call to worship him emanates from that. You know, that's incredible. So we have this first heading there, and we we called it creation. But I'd like to expand on that a little bit and talk a little bit about divine design and purpose in creation. You see, the concept of God as the designer of all creation really presents a compelling argument for the existence of a divine intelligence shaping this universe. I think the fact that there's a design that inherently implies purpose to me, you know, suggesting that the intricate details and order observed in that natural world are not the result of random chance, but rather intentional craftsmanship carrying out the design of the creator and the purpose of the creator. You know, and and so really what I hope you'll see is that that God as a designer really provides evidence for his existence. It just does because it emphasizes the connection between design and purpose in creation. Also the sheer complexity of the universe from macrocosmic scales of galaxies to microcosmic intricacies and molecular structures. All this suggests a thoughtful and intelligent design the precision in which bodies move, the constants that govern the laws of physics, the the delicate balance of ecosystems on the earth all point towards a designer who, yes, intricately, that's the best word I can think of, intricately crafted the cosmos. I mean, I think about Romans 1.20. It echoes this sentiment, doesn't it? It says, for his invisible attributes, namely his 
eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Friends, ex examining the, the biological realm further strengthens the connection between design and purpose. The intricacies, again, of life, from the complexity of DNA to the symbolic or symbiotic relationships with ecosystems reveal the purposeful arrangement that God has. <laughs> the adaptability and the functionality observed in various species highlight a design that facilitates not only survival, but also flourishing in life. Psalm 139, 14 says this, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows very, very well. Friends, in conclusion, the, the evidence of design and creation carries profound implications for the existence of God. The intricate details, the, the order, the purpose observed in universe collectively point towards a divine designer who not only shaped the cosmos, but who also instilled purpose within it. And recognizing that connection between design and purpose invites us to think about the intentionality behind the existence of the universe, which friends to me, it affirms the concept of God. To me, it is evidence of God's existence as our masterful architect and our purposeful creator for all that exists. We've got creation as the first header, and we had a subheading of design and purpose. But I'd like to move to another one now, and that's that of prophecy. You know, the fulfillment of prophecy really does serve as a compelling piece of evidence for the existence of God, showcasing his divine foreknowledge and a purposeful plan for humanity. Throughout history, whether we're talking biblical history or even extra biblical history, sources provide instances where prophecies have been remarkably fulfilled. And friends, I believe that points towards the existence of God, evidence for the existence of God. One of the most profound examples, I think, of fulfilled prophecy can be found in the life of Jesus himself. The Old Testament contains numerous prophecies about the Messiah, you know, predicting details of his birth, of his life, of his death, of his resurrection. For instance, Isaiah 7, 14 foretells the, the virgin birth of the Messiah. And then a century later in Matthew chapter 1, we see records of those prophecies being fulfilled through the birth of Jesus. These accurate fulfillments of very detailed prophecies, not, not, you know, we're talking about detailed prophecies here. We're not talking about something you read in the paper from someone who's trying to, you know, tell your, you know, what's going to happen this week. We're talking about detailed prophecies. The fulfillment of these detailed prophecies really do reinforce the idea and provide evidence of the existence of God. I, I think about another one, the restoration of Israel provides compelling example of fulfilled prophecy. I mean, the Jewish people had been scattered, but yet there were passages that foretold that, that Israel would once again gather as a nation, Ezekiel 37. And we see in, in 1948, the people of Israel reestablish themselves as a nation. The fulfillment of prophecy aligns with the idea that God's plan for nations and peoples extend beyond just human agency. But it, it actually fulfills a supernatural plan and purpose that he has. And beyond biblical instances, historical events also show fulfillment of prophecies. For example, the rise and fall of empires. Uh, we can see the foretelling in Scripture, the prophecy that the, the mighty Babylonian empire would fall. We see that in Isaiah chapter 13, Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51. And, and when we read the historical records of the decline and fall of Babylon, we can't help but think, man, this was foretold. Once again, giving indication and evidence of a God, you know, who 
who exists and is able to give us insight into tomorrow. You see, the consistent and the accurate fulfillment of prophecies, whether recorded in the Bible or observed in historical events, would strongly suggest to you and me that God exists. You know, the existence of a God who is omniscient, knowledgeable, and a sovereign God who has a plan for humanity. And the precision and the detail with which prophecies are realized transcend mere chance, pointing towards a very purposeful orchestrator of history. Prophecy fulfillment stands as a, as a powerful testament to the existence of a divine being who transcends time and space. <laughs> to me, it's evidence of God. But there's one more heading I would like to explore with you before we wrap this up tonight. And that's the, the heading called moral law. The presence of moral law in the fabric of human experience serves as compelling evidence for the existence of God. Moral principles encompassing notions of, of right versus wrong, you know, offer, a, I think, an objective standard that implies a source beyond human subjectivity. You know, that there is a God, a, a, design, a divine moral lawgiver, so to speak. Um, that if we have moral law, it clearly points to the fact that there was a moral lawgiver. Even across divine cultures or diverse cultures, I, I, you know, across diverse cultures and, and all throughout history, there exists a, a remarkable consensus on fundamental moral values, concepts like justice, honesty, compassion. All of these values are pretty much universally recognized as virtuous, which to me says that we share some kind of moral framework, you know, and, and this shared moral framework or intuition or whatever you want to call it, is indicative of an objective moral reality that's ingrained into the human experience. To me, that points towards a creator who put this moral law in the heart of mankind. The human conscience often is described as an internal moral compass, provides individuals with a sense of moral duty. And, and this moral intuition Guiding our actions and judgments implies a deeper innate understanding of right and wrong. I mean, Romans chapter two kind of talks about that, you know? So, so understand that the concept of moral accountability and the belief that actions have moral consequences aligns beautifully with the biblical understanding of God as a just and righteous judge. And the human pursuit of justice and the innate sense that wrongdoing should be punished resonate with the idea of divine moral order <laughs> and the existence of moral consequences and the longing for justice in the face of moral violations support the notion that moral law finds its ultimate explanation in a higher divine authority. Friends, if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. But objective moral values do exist. Therefore, it's reasonable and logical to believe that God, the author of these moral laws, exists. Now, I'm not saying that an atheist can't recognize moral values or even live a generally moral life. But recognizing something or even living by it does not mean that one has the real basis for it. The moral atheist is simply left hanging out to dry in this one in midair, you know, without any solid footing to stand on. Whereas Christians, on the other hand, we have a rock solid foundation on which to build our beliefs and to live our lives. We just do. I guess if I were to, to wrap this up, I would say this to you, that I, I would think one other piece of evidence for 
Believing in the existence of God would be our personal relationship with him. A, a personal relationship with God through Christ serves as compelling evidence for the existence of God. The intimate connection goes beyond intellectual belief, providing a profound and experiential dimension of one's faith as individuals engage in a relationship with God, they often experience transforming life experiences that are difficult to just attribute to a subjective feeling inside of us. But it suggests that we've encountered a divine God, a holy God, who has introduced his purpose into our life. You see, the Bible, particularly the New Testament, emphasizes the possibility of a personal relationship with God through faith in Christ. John chapter 14, verse 23 underscores this. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. Friends, that verse, when I read that verse, it really does highlight the idea that through a personal relationship with Christ, believers can experience the indwelling presence of God, providing a, a tangible and experiential dimension of our faith. And one of the evidences of a personal relationship with God is the transformative power of Christ's influence on our life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. There are profound changes in the person's life which can be submitted as evidence of the presence of God in their life. Profound changes in character and in perspective that believers often undergo stand as a testimony to a living and active relationship with God, which is capable of bringing substantive change in our lives. A, a personal relationship with God is often expressed through prayer and, and practice that allows believers to communicate directly to God. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now the guidance and the comfort and the peace experienced through prayer and communion with God become manifestations of his relationship with us and evidence of his existence. Friends, I think ultimately the most compelling evidence of a personal relationship with God is in the witness of a transformed life. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is, it is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Friends, the testimony of an individual whose life bears substantive life change is tremendous evidence for the existence and the power of God. <laughs> Listen, does God really exist? As Dr. William Lane Craig noted, he said this could be the most important question a person can consider. Our individual choice to believe in or reject the existence of God has enormous implications on how we view life, morality, and humanity. Yet some of us are waiting for that one piece of definitive proof before we believe, all the while ignoring God's activity all around us. And he went on and said, here's the thing. God is trying to get our attention. With every sunrise and sunset, he's trying to get our attention. With every bird chirp, he's trying to get our attention. With every baby's laugh, with every beat of our heart, he's trying to get our attention. But the enemy has done such an amazing job at trying to distract us 24-7 with TV and internet and texting and social media, not to mention the daily demands that's on our life and on our families. He does everything he can to dull our hearing to God's voice. 
So here's what I would encourage you to do. I would learn, I would encourage you to, to get really quiet. And I know that that seems like a weird thing in our world today because quiet seems unproductive in our world. We've grown accustomed to being bombarded with interruptions and noise and, and busyness at every level of life. So we instinctively think uh, that, you know, loneliness or solitude is uncomfortable for us to be in. But I'm here to say you need to cut out the noise, the distractions. And seek to see where God is at work around you because he is at work around you and he's trying to get your attention. Friends, I believe with all my heart that God really exists. And we know this, I think, in the deepest recesses of our hearts. But we must choose to open our minds to his showing us that he is present and actively at work in the world around us and that he cares for us. Thank you for joining me tonight. I, I believe that these are some good headings for us to explore and think through. And I would encourage you to take what I've shared and, and do your own research on it and uh, come up with some good reasons to share with people when they ask, how can you be sure God exists? Well, listen, we've got all kinds of reasons for that. How can you be so close-minded to the fact that God exists? Listen, if you're open to the evidence, I think you'll walk away from the conclusion that there is a God, he does exist, and that he loves you. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Remember, take a few moments if you want. If you want to send me an email, please do. Will at greatbridgebaptist.org. You can do that. Make sure you like this channel or subscribe to this channel uh, so that you can get updates and notifications whenever things are uploaded or when classes uh, come on live. We'd love for you to be aware of those and participate in them. But anyway, God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon. I guess I should say have a wonderful uh, night and get some rest. And I'll look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday night. God bless you.